Hey everybody. Well, here we are. Our first uh, lecture video for Social 204 of many to come. Uh, I'm here in the vinyl attic. Attic? Attic. There's some vinyl over there. Some vinyl over there. I have a little bit of an issue with vinyl. Um, long history working in the music world. That's a whole nother story. You'll get plenty of them. Uh, so uh, for this first video, we're going to take on two topics. Um, the first one is what are the core assumptions of sociology, sort of defining what is sociology, what do we mean when we say sociological thinking and things like that. And the second part is where does sociology come from, <clears throat> sociology's origin story, as if it were a superhero, because it is. Uh, and so um, we're going to get into that in this video, and then there's more stuff in later videos, uh, but this is our first video, so <laughs> let's see how it goes. <clears throat> I swear I'm okay. <coughs> we'll see. Okay, so we want to start. So if I didn't say so before, uh, you'll want to take notes. All this stuff could be on the midterm or on the final exam, so make sure you take good notes. It always seems like there's a problem when people don't take notes, um, but the good news is on these videos, you can always go back to them because they're on YouTube and you can rewind or whatever you need to do, but make sure you get this info down. That's the um, paternalistic tone I'm taking, and that's it for that. So the first part is uh, defining sociology. What is sociology? What is sociology? So let's give you a real basic textbook definition of sociology, and then we'll talk about you know what all that means. So our textbook definition of what is sociology, because probably a lot of you, this is your first sociology class. I didn't have a sociology class in high school. It wasn't until I was at college, and I never really knew what it was. I just thought it had to do something with people. So, uh, so here's our definition. Ready? The scientific, sociology is the scientific study of human society and social behavior. And let me break that down. The scientific study, so this is science, this is a social science, which means we're going to talk a lot about the values of science and the methods of science. This is science. This isn't just people having ideas about things and talking about people. This is the scientific study. So that means rigorous methodology, uh, scientific principles about validity and verification, all these things that we're going to talk about. They're on chapter one of Giddens. The scientific study of human society. So we're not studying ant society. We're studying human society and social behavior, how we interact with each other as opposed to interacting in a vacuum. The scientific study of human society and social behavior. That is our definition. Uh, and so we have to unpack a lot of that, and there's three main assumptions that we really work on when we talk about what is sociology, what I like to call the sociological mantras, the things that kind of hold all of sociology together. And the first uh, core assumption of sociology is the notion of tabula rasa. See, we're already starting with some Latin, tabula rasa. Does anybody out there know what tabula rasa is Latin for? That's right. Blank slate, blank slate. So imagine a, a chalkboard or a whiteboard that has nothing drawn on it, that is completely brand new. That is us when we are born. And the idea is that there's this assumption that we're, we're all born blank slates. We're all born whiteboards with nothing. Mm, sounds kind of racist. We're all born these sort of, you know, clean slates. And through the process of our lives, we have things written upon us that make us who we are. So we start off blank a baby, ah, and then all this stuff starts happening to us. And we'll be talking a lot about that, which is what we call socialization. Uh, and we become who we are. So underneath tabula rasa, there are kind of three, three sub ideas here. The first is what tabula rasa means is this phrase, and I know you've heard it before. You are the product of your environment. We're all the product of our environment. We are the product of the things that are written onto our slates, our chalkboards. That's the first one. Uh, the second one is that that means we tend to value nurture over nature. Sometimes I get that backwards. Nurture over nature. So nature is the biological, who you are biologically. Uh, the nurture is how society has created who you are and very little of it has to do with biology not all of it so one of the topics we'll get into and it's why we're reading this book by Rianne Eisler is the concept of gender a lot of people think that gender is biological gender is just about 
your chromosomes or your genitals, and that's that. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But as we'll discuss, gender varies greatly around the world. It gra values, varies greatly over time. What it means to be masculine or feminine in Portland 2020 is very different than what it would mean to be masculine or feminine in India in 1820. Very different, very different. So the nurture is more important than the nature. Not, we're not discounting nature, not the, discounting the biological, but we tend to think since you're the product of your, of your environment, tabula rasa, um, nurture is more important than nature, which is then the third part of the tabula rasa thing, which is um, the importance of where and when. Where you grow up, where in the world, Carmen San Diego, do you grow up in the jungle? Do you grow up in the desert? Do you, are you a country mouse? Are you a city mouse? Uh, do you grow up in, you know, in Pakistan? Or do you grow up in South Africa? Or do you grow up in outer Mongolia or outer Montana? I mean, they're all, you're going to have very different experiences, including what religion you have, right? You know, where, where you're born in the world is the most likely determinator of what your faith is. Are you born in Saudi Arabia or are you born in Catholic Poland, right? There's a big difference there on how you grow up thinking about God, which is another thing we'll talk about. But not just where, but also when, where and when. When you are born, Carmen San Diego, when are you born, what time are you born in? We have a lot of students at PCC who were born in the 21st century, right? I mean, let's face it, a lot of people were born in the year 2000 or after, many of you, I'm sure. Me, I was born in the 20th century, sometime in the mid 20th century. I won't say when, it was a long time ago. My experience of the world being born in the 1960s uh, is different than somebody being born in the 2000s. Your experience of how you have been nurtured by the world is very different. So there's a lot of people that have never known a world without the internet, have never known a world without Google. Um, I mean, we used to think it was really weird that there were people who never existed without MTV. Like, that's how far back I go. So, uh, so where you are is important, but also when you are is important to that nurturing. So we like to say that where, where plus when, I'll put this up here, where plus when equals who, meaning equals you. Your experience in the world is is shaped by where in the world you are and when in the world you are. So that's our first uh, core assumption, tabula rasa, the blank slate. You are the product of your environment, where and when matter, uh, nurture over nature. The second one are, are these terms that we will use a lot in here, which is the notion of the, the micro and the macro. The sociology is about the relationship between the micro and the macro. So micro just means small like microscopic, looking through a microscope, you know, a small individual level. Macro means big, macro, like macro uh, economics. Somebody who's interested in macroeconomics is studying the global economic patterns or into the macro level economics. So when you talk about micro is small, macro is big. For us, what we're talking about is micro is the individual level, the relationship between two people in a family or two people in a relationship or two people, you know, who work with each other. Uh, or two people who, you know, I don't know, hang out together versus the macro, the societal level. And we're always interested in how the macro level, the societal level that we exist in. So America 2020 would be sort of an example of a macro level uh, social structure, how the macro impacts the micro. What's the impact of the macro, the big, on the individual? So we sort of focus on, you know, the way they go back and forth, but really focusing on the impact of the macro on the micro, how, again, you're the product of society. So we're going to go back to this notion of gender a lot, how you are, your ideas of gender on an individual level, and you and the, and the person you're having, you know, an intimate or a personal relationship with is shaped by society. We can see how those societal level uh, changes impact people. So for example, uh, we talk about attitudes, your personal attitudes are very micro, the way you feel about particular issues, the way you might feel about COVID-19 or the way you might feel about Bernie Sanders. You know, these are things that we sort of share uh, as personal ideas. But we know that these ideas are shaped 
uh, even though they're very personal to us, are shaped by the external. So a really good example of that is the attitude on same-sex marriage, marriage equality, uh, the ability of people who are same-sex gay to be able to marry each other. Uh, in a 10-year period, in a 10-year period between the time we do this data collection, uh, between basically from 2000 to 2010 and then 2010 to 2020, uh, we've seen a dramatic shift of the majority of Americans being opposed to marriage equality, meaning, you know, not thinking that gay people should have the right to get married, to be being in favor for it. We had a 10-year flip of those numbers that the majority of Americans in a very short period, for, in 10 years, went from being against same-sex marriage or marriage equality to being for it. Did those people just change on a micro level? Or did society change around them? And so one of the ex explanations for that is more people felt safe coming out of the closet, meaning, you know, being their true selves and being gay. And so uh, people who were opposed to uh, same-sex marriage, you know, might have had ideas about homosexuality, but they didn't know any actual gay people. They thought they all lived in San Francisco or something. And all of a sudden, as people started coming out, and it was their brothers and sisters and friends at work and classmates and children, uh, those attitudes changed because of something that was happening on a macro level that allowed people to feel more safe about being out sexually that caused those micro level changes in attitude. That's just one example of many that we'll talk about. So the second assumption is a relationship of the micro and the macro, especially how the macro impacts the micro. Got it? Cool. Okay. And the third one is, and this sounds a little weird, is the power to see the familiar as strange. What do I mean by that? It's going um, to it's gonna tie into somebody we're going to talk about in the next lecture, this guy named C. Wright Mills. Uh, the power to appreciate other people's viewpoints. And so we um, say that as the power to look at the familiar as strange. So our, the world that we know is familiar, right? And sometimes when you look at another culture, it could be a tribal culture, it could be a Russian society, it could be you know, Latin America, something that's different than ours, it seems very weird. Like, oh, why do they eat those foods? Or why do they wear their hair that way? Or what? Do I, they don't, I mean, there are so many cultural variations that we look at. It seemed really weird to us. I don't know if anybody's ever watched the show Survivor, but they used to have, like, the people, you know, that were competing in, eat the local food, and it just seemed so bizarre. Um, but when you think about it, what seems familiar to us would be bizarre to them. I mean, think about like our obsession with dairy products. What is dairy? <laughs> the milk, the milk of cows. Like we don't generally eat goat milk or pig milk or dog milk. I mean, any type of man, we could have people milk for that matter, but we just don't do that. But we have this obsession with the mucus of cows uh, that is so much of our diet. Think about it. It's really weird, right? And when you have people come from other cultures and aren't as dairy uh, focus as we are. Like, what's up with yogurt? <laughs> what's up with all these weird cheeses that you guys are obsessed with? Don't you know where that comes from? It seems very weird. So the, the value of this is if we can see our world as kind of strange to other people, and we'll get into the culture, how weird our culture is. Um, I mean, what is up with people buying endless amounts of toilet paper and hoarding it? What's going on? What is behind that? Anybody else from outside our culture would be like, why aren't you guys taking care of each other? You're killing each other for rolls of toilet paper when it's not even a part of this virus that's going around? <laughs> like, what is it about your culture? You're very weird. So the value of that, of being able to do that, the strange as the familiar and the familiar as strange, uh, is the ability to build empathy, to understand other people's perspectives, to understand other people's experiences, and to be able to drop into their world and say, well, you know, headhunting might look really weird to us, you know, if we were going to New Guinea and meeting a tribe of headhunters, but if we try to understand it from their perspective, you know, maybe kind of the things that we do look pretty weird to them. So we, you know, ultimately in our, in our world want to try to build more empathy, more understanding, and so that's one of the things that sociology can do. The world is strange. Um, and we want to understand how we're also strange, you know, and that includes our religion, our eating habits, our gender practices. I mean, we it's weird. Why do women shave their arm, armpits? I'm going to let that hang there 
Why do women shave their armpits in our culture? Not in all cultures. In fact, not in most cultures, they don't. But why in our culture is it required for a woman to shave her armpits and her legs and whatever else? What? Why? What? There must be something there. Maybe it's the macro influencing the micro. Um, and maybe it's tabula rasa. So, um, so those are our three core assumptions that we're going to be spending time on this term, which is um, blank slate, tabula rasa, the impact of the macro on the micro, and strange as the familiar, and the familiar is strange, those two things. So we will um, bounce back to those several times. I have a feeling these little lectures are going to go by a lot faster because I'm just here by myself instead of looking at your faces, trying to figure out if you're getting it or not. Okay, so that's part number one of this first mini lecture. Part number two is a little bit of history uh, and talking about where sociology comes from. Now, I have to say, um, in all fairness and honesty, that this sort of origin story of sociology is very Eurocentric based. And this is a very Eurocentric, American centric, Canadian centric, Western uh, defined discipline. Similar ideas have come from the Middle East, have come from Africa, have come from Asia, have come from all other parts of the world. But because this discipline was sort of colonized and defined by white guys in Europe for the most part, we get sort of the European version of it. And I just want to be really honest about that because often. There are other stories that get left out. In fact, your textbook kind of acknowledges some of these um, these other stories that are there and how the voices of people of color and the voices of women often get left out of these really important core founding stories. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in Europe. And so to tell the story, we've got to talk about an important historical phase in the world called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, sometimes called the A Age of Reason. Okay, the Enlightenment. Have you ever heard of it? Very important. It's the reason we're here. It's the reason you're here. You might not even know you're here, but it's all because of the Enlightenment. So if you think about Europe in the Middle Ages, the medieval period, uh, it was ruled by one primary source of power, and that was the Catholic Church, right? The Catholic Church sort of emerges, um, you know, like around the third century becomes kind of the powerhouse of, of the modern modern world. That's an ethnocentric term. Uh, but becomes sort of the center of the world. Rome is sort of the absolute center of the universe for a lot of folks. Uh, and it stays that way for a long time, for a thousand years. There's very little change in Europe. Uh, in fact, one of the things that creates the most change, and this is sort of where I'm finding a little bit of um, hope at the moment, is the, the Black Pet Plague, the bubonic plague, which kills millions of people. Uh, and in the 1300s, 1340s, late 1340s, and um, pretty horrible. I mean, we're not there yet. COVID-19 is not the bubonic plague yet, and, and probably won't be, so just chill out. Um, but anyway, that, um, that huge thing that hit Europe and wiped it out, basically because of people didn't know about germs, um, gave way to, for the Renaissance, gave way to people like Leonardo Di DiCaprio, Leonardo da Vinci, not Leonardo DiCaprio. He was not an Enlightenment painter or inventor. Leonardo da Vinci uh, and the Mona Lisa and, uh, and you know all the great stuff that came out of the Renaissance was because Europeans were um, almost all died. So they became sort of obsessed with life and, and instead of focusing on the afterlife, they started painting and inventing and um, that, I mean, that the Renaissance was sort of a, a blip in it, but for the most part, the Catholic Church sort of runs the show. Then we get the Protestant Reformation. The pro, you know, we're going to talk a lot about Protestantism, and I always think it's, I, I'm assuming that people know what Protestantism is. In fact, um, I'm going to give you a little assignment. Uh, if you don't know what Protestants are or what Protestantism is, uh, you'll want to do a little. Um, a little Googling. Um, one of the terms that we will use in this class, I'm just backing up a little bit as I think about this, is the term WASP. Have you ever heard that acronym? WASP, W-A-S-P. Do you know what that stands for? You're looking at one? I am a WASP. Uh, WASP is an acronym for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, the WASP 
culture is that has been the dominant culture in America, although that's changing and that's something we'll also talk about. Uh, but to talk about what's normal in America is usually to talk about a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and everybody else sort of challenges that, including, uh, you know, Latinos and Catholics and Jews and Muslims and all the other things that are not wasps. So, um, so it's important to know what the P is in the wasp thing, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So keep that in the back of your head. So the Protestant Reformation comes along and really starts to kind of undermine the authority of the Catholic Church, because this is the way it works. You know, by the way, sociologists love religion, so we're going to be talking about a religion a whole bunch in this class. Um, the Protestant Reformation, it really kind of happens in the 1500s, uh, is a response to the power structure of the Catholic Church. Because in those days, let's just go to Europe, you know, 1520, right, 500 years ago, uh, most people can't read. Uh, the books uh, that are holy are the Bible, which is sort of coming together as the King James Version at the time. There are multiple versions of it, but they are all written in Latin, uh, and they are handwritten by monks. So, you know, a monk would sit with a Bible, and he wanted an another Bible. I don't know if you ever read the Bible, but it's pretty gosh darn long. And they would start at the beginning, Genesis 1, in the beginning, and they would just handwrite the whole thing all the way to the end of Revelations. Uh, sometimes they would change things because they didn't like, I don't like the, that word choice. Let's change it. And so, but basically, if you wanted to know about God and you wanted to know about where you came from and what happened when you die and what the meaning of everything is, it was up to the people who could read the Bible, which were the priests, the priestly class, the Pope and the people who sort of ran the show. And everybody was just like, oh, what does all this mean? And so the, the, the Catholic Church has an incredible amount of power to say this is what God means. Well, this dude, Martin Luther, came along in the 1520s and it's like, yeah, you know, people are starting to learn how to read. Uh, and there's this new thing called the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press, so that instead of monk laboriously writing a Bible, they could start mass producing, not kind of like, not like Amazon, but, you know, kind of in a, in a higher number, start producing more Bibles to get them into people's hands. And as people began to read and get Bibles in their own hands, they would read and be like, uh, I don't think it's not, I don't think it says what you think it says. I think this is what it says. And so the Protestant Reformation was all about letting people, instead of deferring to the power of the Pope, letting people figure it out for themselves. Letting people, you know, sort of figure out what God meant in this sacred book that was written by people. Uh, let them figure out for themselves. So created this crack in the power of the Catholic Church in Europe in the 1500s. It was crack. All of a sudden, they weren't the only, um, only game in town. And that has a lot to do with the Gutenberg Press. Uh, it was invented in the 14, 1450s that really started that. Thank you, Gutenberg. Thank you, Martin Luther, for nailing the protest on the door and getting people to start thinking for themselves. Um, and so it really kind of ended, not ended, but challenged the domain of the Catholic Church. So Protestant Reformation sort of sets the stage for the Enlightenment, but really the guy that sets the stage, and when we're talking about the Enlightenment, by the way, we're really talking about sort of the 1700s in Europe and, and America. This is where it really takes off in the 1700s and the 18th century, culminating in 1789, which is the French Revolution, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the big deal here is Galileo. Good old Galileo. Galileo, Galilei. Uh, lived in the late 1500s and early 1600s, and um, he was an interesting character. He was an astronomer. I'm sure you know the story of Galileo, uh, and Galileo really changed the way people thought about the world. What do I mean by that? Because the Catholic Church said 500 years ago and more that the earth and the sun um, are sort of locked together but the sun is going around the earth. The sun is going around the earth, and so are the planets, and so are the stars. The Bible says the absolute center of the universe is the earth, and actually Jerusalem is the very center of the universe. So, so the sun is going around the earth. And we still have vestiges of that, right? We say the sun is rising and the sun is setting, but it's not. We're just turning away from the sun or toward it. The sun doesn't rise. It looks like it, right? When you're spending your day, like, oh, there's the sun coming up. Oh, there it goes, setting in the west. Um, but in fact, we're just turning toward it or away from it. 
All right, we're just going like that. And you see, the this is the cosmos. Uh, and Galileo uh, was taking on this idea, this idea, it actually had been around since the Egyptians, but from this guy Copernicus, who had a, what was called a heliocentric view of the world, that said... Um, the earth is going around the sun the other way. The Catholic Church is wrong. And it was a theory that was bouncing around uh, and uh, for a while. And But what Galileo did is Galileo, and this is important, Galileo took this very rational notion that the earth was going around the sun and not the other way. And he did research. He got his little telescopes out, did some calculations, looked at the stars, looked at Mars and Jupiter and figured it all out and realized the Catholic Church was wrong. That we were, in fact, going around the sun and not the other way. The Catholic Church was not happy about this because if they were wrong uh, about the whole cosmology of the universe, what else might they be wrong about? And so they were very powerful. Uh, and so there was a little inquisition, as it was called. Uh, Galileo was put on trial for heresy, for daring to go against the church. Uh, he was convicted. Uh, apparently, while when he was being convicted, he said it still turns, meaning I'm right, you're wrong, uh, and was was fine was uh, locked up in his house uh, in Italy, uh, sort of un house arrest as we might call it now, uh, and spent the rest of his days in under house arrest because he dared go against the church. Now, before this sounds like you know bashing the Catholic Church, let me point out the Catholic Church did pardon Galileo uh, in the year 1992. Pope John Paul II. They were like, eh, I think we were wrong about that one. Uh, but it was a huge crack in the power of the Catholic Church. So you have these sort of one-two punch. The first thing is the Enlightenment. Uh, read the Bible and think for yourself instead of listen to what these priests are telling you. Uh, and then Galileo comes along and does research to Copernicus theory and says, like, the Catholic Church is wrong. We've got some empirical evidence. And that really paves the way for... Uh, what becomes known as the Age of Reason or the Enlightenment. It, by the 1700s, so uh, Galileo's um, Inquisition, his trial is in 1615, and it really kind of opens up. The end of the 1600s and the beginning of the 1700s, there's this explosion of science. There's this explosion of rational thinking. And there are these two principles, these two values, and we'll talk a lot about what we mean by values, but these two values, and this is probably good for a test question, these two values are really guiding the Enlightenment. The first is a notion of rationality. What's rational? What makes sense? What was makes sense? Does it make sense? Does Noah's Ark, does that story make sense? Uh, two of each animal uh, were put on a boat and then God killed everybody on the flood, every animal, every baby, every family, every grandmother just drowned them, which is like the worst way to die. Maybe dying in a fire. Uh, and then those animals got off the boat after 40 days and 40 nights and repopulated. I mean, there's just like thousands of different types of monkeys. <laughs> so it's not like the most rational story. Uh, the earth created in six days. Is that a, in a, in a 6,000 years old, is that a rational story? So this idea of rationality became very popular. How do we think about things rationally? How do we think about things in a way that makes sense? Sort of like I had to take it, Emory, I had to take a lot of uh, logic you know, if A plus if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? These types of logic. If you ever had a geography, a geography, geometry class, and had to do proofs, like those proofs are all based on sort of rational logic theories. So this, the first value was rationality. Let's be rational about things that they have to make sense. But the second part is this notion of empiricism. Empiricism just means observable. Uh, observable things that you can see, what we might call uh, research. Let's do observable research. So this is what Galileo did. He had a rational theory that the sun uh, is at the center uh, of our solar system and we're going around it and the planets are going around it. He had the rational theory and he did the research. All right, he did the research. Um, and so this is an explosion of science, an explosion of science that happened, the modern science, botany and you know, all our favorite sciences, I can't even, entomology. I mean, there are all kinds of things that sort of came out of the Enlightenment. Let me give you three things that came out of the Enlightenment, this explosion of rational thinking. 
um, because there were all these French uh, guys called the philosophe philosophies who were saying like, well, let's be more rational about the world. Darwin comes out of this. Darwin, let's find out where we come from. It makes sense to go and sort of study and look for evidence of adaptation. And maybe we've been on the planet a little bit longer than 6,000 years. Look, there's a dinosaur bone. How does that fit into the story? Um, so here's three things that come out of the Enlightenment. And then the fourth one is going to be sociology. The first thing is the encyclopedia. The whole notion of the Enlightenment is you learn stuff uh, and then you put it down somewhere and then you learn more stuff and you see if it fits with the stuff that you learned. And if you need to adapt it, then you adapt it and you sort of keep building and accumulating knowledge. So Wikipedia, I guess, would be the modern version of this. So the, the, the encyclopedia is an enlightenment creation, the idea of like, let's put knowledge in a place where people can go look at it and say, huh. How about this? Let's add to this. So Enlightenment gives us the encyclopedia. It also gives us something called the ant farm. Some of you people have probably never heard of an ant farm. Before the days of the internet and video games, things were much simpler when I was a child. Let me tell you, we didn't have multiple player online games. I mean, I come from the era like the 80s. We just got started on like Frogger. <laughs> Can I get the frog across the stream? Donkey Kong, that seems so advanced. Um, before that, when I was a kid, there, we had ant farms, which were like two pieces of plastic with dirt and ants. And what's the point of that? Well, dirt, before the Enlightenment, people used to think, you know where ants come from? They come from hell. They come from hell, and they attack you on your picnic and bite your ankles, and then they go back to hell. That was sort of the view. That was sort of the... Catholic Church version, you know, they were these little demons. And they said, let's study ants. Let's let's create a cross-section of what it looks like and see what the ants are doing under their ant hills. What happens when the ants go into the ground? Let's observe. Let's be empirical to find out, you know, the truth, the actual truth. And so people, they became very popular in the late 1700s ant farms and went all the way up to the, you know, the late 20th century. I don't know if you can still get an ant farm, but... Um, I had one when I was a kid, and we were just like, hey, let's go over to Randy's house and look at ants for an hour. Uh, those were the days. So the encyclopedia, the ant farm. Uh, uh, and the third thing that we get out of the Enlightenment is the United States of America. I think you might have heard of that one. Uh, the whole idea, you know, when we were a colony, uh, we were a colony uh, under a king. And there was this thing called the divine right of kings. So kings were usually, kings and queens were given power by the church, the Church of England or the Catholic Church, like in France. Uh, and basically it was sort of a chain of command between the royal sovereign and the head of the church and God. Basically that God, head of the church, king or queen, and then the rest of us lowly people down here. Uh, and a bunch of uh, American uh, Enlightenment thinkers, including Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, who were spending a lot of time in Paris studying all this uh, philosophy, said, why don't we have a rational system? One man, one vote. And of course, at that time, they meant one white man with property, one vote. It, was a long, it wasn't until 100 years ago that women even got the right to vote. But they had this idea of let's be rational and, and self-govern. Let's create this rational system with three branches of government, which we still have. <sighs> We still have for the moment uh, checks and balances and create a constitution. And it's all based on the rationality principles of the Enlightenment. The Greeks sort of taught them how to do it. And then it was all buried by the Catholic Church for a thousand years. Uh, and they brought it back. So we are here. We are products of the Enlightenment. And there's a lot of people that would argue, when does the Enlightenment end? Because sort of the peak of this culmination was the American Revolution starts in 1776, and then the French Revolution in 1789, July 14th, Juillet 14th, July 14th, the Bastille Day, when they stormed the Bastille and freed the political prisoners in Paris, was really the culmination of uh, Enlightenment thinking. French Revolution didn't go quite as well as the American Revolution, ended in what was called the Reign of Terror, and a lot of people got their heads chopped off and then ended up with this little guy, Napoleon. Uh, so it went a little bit south. And we'll also talk about that. But um, but anyway, that's sort of the peak. But then what, what, when does the Enlightenment end? Well, we like to think we're still in the Enlightenment, that science and rationality and empiricism still matters. But there are those who would say that the Enlightenment starts to die on September 11th, 2001, when... The, 
America, the great center of the, the 20th century enlightenment, is attacked by religious fundamentalists uh, on that day in 2001. And the end of it continues, including with the war on science and the war on facts from our current administration that are very, very anti-enlightenment and very, you know, I mean, how many times after a presidential press briefing about the coronavirus do the fact checkers have to come out and say, actually, that's not true. Here's what science tells us. <laughs> We should put a health warning across the president's face. You know, don't listen to this guy because, he, you know, tells a good story. But sometimes he's a little far off on the truth. So are we, is the Enlightenment dead? This is a debate where we've really kind of been in, in the thick of since 9-11 and continue to be on on this day. So I mentioned there were four things that come out of the Enlightenment. Ant farms probably not being the most amazing, but pretty great. The fourth one is sociology. If we can be scientific about ants and the stars in the sky, and we can be scientific about flowers and animals and the adaptation of the human race, and if we can be applying these principles of rationality and empiricism, the plants, animals, and planets, why can't we do it about people? Why can't we study people instead of thinking people were just driven by demons or driven by gods and angels? Why can't we be scientific about how humans interact? So sociology is one of the things that comes out of the Enlightenment, um, that uh, there is this guy in the 1700s, well, really 1800s, named Auguste Comte, Auguste Comte, 1798 to 1857, um, French philosopher uh, who kind of came up with the idea that let's be rational about people, let's study people. Let's apply these principles of rationality and empiricism to understanding people. Uh, and he was, wanted to focus on sort of two things. One is he wanted to look at stability and social, social order, what he called social statics. Why do things stay the same forever? Why do, you know, why does Europe go for a thousand years and except for the blip of the Renaissance? It really doesn't change very much. It's still castles and queens and all, you know, dungeons and not dragons. That's that other show. Um, you know, why is there so much stability uh, and how do they maintain this sort of balance? But the other thing he was interested in is what he called social dynamics, radical change. Why does this change happen? I mean, think about the late 1700s in Europe and America and these revolutions that just started taking off and getting rid of, you know, the king and chopping their heads off and, you know, all this sort of incredible changes happening. Also, the Industrial Revolution is starting to happen and people are moving into the cities. I mean, why why do things sort of change on a dime like that? So that was what he called social dynamics. What causes change to happen, especially after you've had so much stability? So he wanted to apply these principles and really kind of think about society scientifically. And for that great idea, we give Auguste Comte the mantle or the crown of being known as the father of sociology. Auguste Comte, father of sociology. We don't know where the mother is. She ran off with the mailman, I guess. Uh, but yeah, this really all starts with Comte. And so if anybody ever asks you, including on a midterm, who's the father of sociology, the answer is Auguste Comte, uh, because he applied these principles of the Enlightenment to people. To people! To us, we can be scientific about it. It's a little bit more challenging because people are a little crazy sometimes and it's a little bit harder to study than atoms or mice or flowers because people are nuts. But but we, um, we've we kind of figured out how to do that. So that's what we're going to be talking about this quarter is how we're sociological, how we apply these enlightenment principles uh, of empiricism and rationality to understanding why we do the cuckoo things that we do. And we'll talk about crime, we'll talk about race, we'll talk about gender, we'll talk about the family, we'll talk about religion for sure, we'll talk about a lot of this stuff, but it's all going to be following from this sort of enlightenment um, tradition that we have. Okay, so that's the first lecture thing. The next one's coming up on the video soon. Uh, what we're going to get into next are sort of two important core ideas in sociology. One is called the sociological imagination, and another is something that's pretty mind-blowing called the social construction of reality. Those that That's kind of a bigger lecture. But I just wanted to get us off the ground with this kind of introductory lecture about the three core assumptions, tabula rasa, macro and micro, macro, ma tabula rasa, micro, ma I'm sorry, and uh, strange as, as the familiar, and familiar is strange. That really looks wrong. Those three things, uh, and then how we are a product of enlightenment thinking.
Cool. Did that go okay? Was that good for our first little lecture? I hope so. Uh, you'll be getting email message uh, and questions, uh, and you will be um, responding to uh, some question that I'm going to give you about this material, which I'll figure out at some point. Uh, so watch for the emails, and that's how you'll give the feedback. I wish we could be in the room together, but um, but this room is pretty cool, so maybe someday uh, you can come over and hang out in my vinyl attic. Okay, see you next time.